Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Harvey Schuster. I want to welcome you here this morning, and uh, I want to thank Alan DeBerry and all the people who are going to be on the panel, which will be introducing. He's the chairman of Airwatch, who did the keynote uh, introduction this morning. He has an incredible company, I think you uh, probably all know. Security is an essential space in the mobility area. Uh, I'm a member of the Southeast Software Association, which we helped put together the panel, but we want to thank everybody for um, being on the panel itself, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Harvey. Everybody, come on up. Okay, well, thank you all for joining the security panel, and as everybody is uh, uh, getting situated. So, I, I use a little bit of the expression that Pandora is out of the box. Uh, when you think about these devices, everybody is using them. I don't think people think twice about certain elements of things, and we've got a great panel here that's going to be able to talk about the security, the risks, the things you should be thinking about, the integration with privacy. Privacy and security do not always go hand in hand. Privacy and usability, uh, or privacy and, and, and security, and security and usability, all of these are in, in many ways in conflict. And, and, and so secondly, I use the expression that, to some extent, the cart is way ahead of the horse. When you think of these devices getting out, and, and uh, you know, I think of the, the, the market share of Manhattan or mobile <coughs> security products or mobile device management, and we realize that we are probably under 5% of enterprise devices that have any kind of meaningful security on them. And there is a lot of bad things that probably are happening every day, but the old saying, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, did it really fall? Did it matter? If somebody finds a device and gets into a lot of information and does a small insider trade and makes a little bit of money and the company doesn't get in trouble and nobody finds out about it, did it really happen? Did anybody care? And I propose these things are happening every day, we just don't see them. And the last expression I use, uh, I've taken thanks to Wendy's, and maybe you guys remember when somebody put a finger in the chili and it made the front page of the news, so I call this the finger in the chili problem. This is uh, when something happens and, and maybe you weren't even at fault, but suddenly you're on the front page of the news. And there's never really been this huge mobile security breach that's happened to this point. And so we've gotten into this false sense of security. It's the, well, the black swan may, must not exist because I've never seen one, or gee, uh, you know, not to pull up a really bad event, but nobody would ever fly a plane into a building kind of a thing. And the fact that nobody has thought through all of these devices and the interactions, um, and especially, I would say, at prima facie at the business level. I th certainly think people are thinking about how do we secure the grid and how do we secure once cars start driving themselves that they don't get attacked. But in terms of a, a lot of the really day-to-day -day things, how do I make sure my files don't get lost? How do I make sure when something, when a device gets lost, it's not compromised, that users can't squirrel away a lot of data, things like that? So we've got this really great panel here today to talk about these things. Uh, and we've got Chris Huff uh, from the Weather Channel, who's Vice President of Mobile and Consumer Apps. We've got uh, Jim Gwynn uh, from PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, who runs their security and uh, technology practice. Uh, Phil, uh, the hardest part of these days is always some of the last names or the names, but uh, Ed Kawili. You got it. Oh. Or he said, just go with Phil A, uh, which I could have done. But Chief Information Security Officer for Cox Communications. Um, and finally, uh, Dr. Humayun Zafar, Assistant Professor of Information Security Assurance at Kennesaw State. Uh, and this group is going to give two or three minutes on their views of mobile security. Uh, and then we're going to ask a handful of questions that have been prepared, but I really want the questions to come out of the audience. So please be thinking about what are the things that you really want to know about security, privacy, and the interrelation of those uh, as we get deeper into this. So we'll start over here with Chris. Ah, thanks. Um, so when I think about security, I think about it's always easier to look back in technology to see kind of some mistakes we made in the, in the past. One of my favorite technology innovations was the muscle car. So 
So when I think back in the 60s and 70s, there was this pl proliferation of muscle cars, right? You had 400 horsepower cars. You had this uh, freeways that were just starting out. Uh, you have four lane freeways crossing the, the states. Uh, you've got no seat belts, no seat belt regulation. And so there was this exuberance that exceeded the safety precautions, the guardrails, if you will. So I, I, I think it's a good analogy with where we are in mobile, right? We've got this exuberance that's almost exceeding our ability to protect consumers. So that's how I think of it. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of opportunities. At the Weather Channel, we do, uh, we take a lot of care to protect our, our customers. and. Um, I think safety is the best policy in that regard, uh, but I think there's, there, there is going to be something that, that changes the tide with this and makes this uh, come to the forefront in users' minds. And uh, to the audience, remember that the Weather Channel gets an awful lot of private data of location, and let's think about this as we're thinking about some questions. Jim, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, as we shared earlier, my name is Jim Gwynn. I'm with PwC. I lead our mobile security core team for the U.S. Arm, so we... Um, we get a lot of experience and exposure to various security platforms or security issues as they relate to mobility or technology in general. Um, I would challenge the, the audience and, and also the panel to think about security far beyond just the information security that sits on a device. That can be managed, that can be wiped, that can be cleaned. But think about security in the, in the context of business security, right? And securing your business or your business assets or the concepts around your business. Um, Things that we'll talk to clients about are things that you should be thinking about is as you embark on significant mobile application development for your employees or your staff or your, or your teams are, where are they actually doing that work? Where are they doing it and is it okay that they're doing that work from a particular place, a state, a region, a country, right? If you think about the way the business was done previously, <clears throat> people in say oil and gas or in industrial manufacturing that, that travel all over the globe they might actually go and call on a client or meet a client and do a transaction verbally and then come back to their home office in the United States and type that up and send it out. And they've actually created maybe a taxable event. What happens with mobility on a, pa on a, on a tablet or some sort of a, a phone or a mobile device where I can actually create an order right there? And I did it in a foreign entity that I don't have any sort of legal entity to actually pay for taxes in that area. So you're, you also need to think about securing the business and not information security on the device and how you actually use that device and what the use cases are around that device and the applications they have. So we try to open our clients' perspectives up much broader than just information security, much to your, your conversation. The muscle cars, first thing's a safety belt, then the nader bolt, then you know, windshields that are laminated. We're trying to expand the conversation, not just one step at a time, but, but further reaching across security for the business. Right, Phil? Good morning. So um, I'm going to start off by a crowd participation. Everybody repeat after me. Freedom. Freedom. Security. Security. Convenience. Convenience. OK, I just trained you in that order. Freedom, security, convenience. Right? And so I won't say that I'm, I'm very old, but um, uh, from when I, was, when I was young, I always um, dreamed of uh, the mobile lifestyle. So in the early 90s, I was one of those folks that bought into a vision from a company that no longer exists called USR Robotics. They, um, they, they came out with a technology called the Palm, uh, quickly acquired by, by, by um, 3Com, uh, became the Palm Pilot, Palm Pilot Pro. I bought every single device. Um, that, that device was running on an operating system that I thought sucked. And I was um, brought into the world of Windows, and um, I, I started buying sub subcompact notebooks from China and Japan as, as fast as I can import them. And so I bought in 95, bought my first Toshiba libretto. It was a subcompact, subcompact computer about this big. Um, it ran Windows NT 3.5. Um, and I continued to buy mobile technologies as they evolved. Right, so from, from Microsoft's Pocket PC to Windows Mobile, um, all the way through until my eyes opened up in 2007 with the first Apple device, right, with the first iPhone. And who would have thought that it all started connecting all these different capabilities that weren't existing in those that several decades before that? Mobility, you know, high-speed internet, 3G, right? It started bringing cloud, um, ubiquitous app. It wasn't just heavy-duty applications. It was app capabilities. And it brought it into this little device, right? 
And what's interesting is, you know, this little device, you know, who would have thought, you know, this little light, right, could be done out of a phone? But have you guys ever taken a look in the App Store um, on both Android and Apple and taken a look at what permissions these things are asking for? Your full contact data, your network access, access to your email. And the reality is, you know, with the, with the Edward Snowden um, leak this summer, what it really did was taint my vision of that mobile space. And um, I think the reality is, and we'll talk further, I think is, um, you know, where do we stand today from a security, from a privacy perspective? And we're finding a lot about our environment today on what people's perception of privacy means. They will, they will post everything that they can. They will download every application. They could do it, um, doesn't matter what geography. I can plop a, a square device on this and take a sale in China or in the US or in Russia. Where do the taxes come from? Where's the liability of that sale um, happen? And so I, I agree that mobility is about to change a whole bunch of things, but at what cost? And so I'm gonna end it with where I started. Repeat after me. Freedom. Freedom. Security. Security. Convenience. In that order. So you guys can't see this, but everybody does have a mobile device in front of them. Phil actually has two, uh, other than, than Jim, who's got a pad of paper in front of him, which means we all use mobile differently and at different times, and that's one of the great things about it. That's so a palm pilot, this is actually. The, this that is the, the original conundrum here. <laughs> uh, Humayun. Well, uh, like Alan introduced me earlier, my name is Dr. Yamani Zafar. I'm an assistant professor of information security and assurance. Uh, sad part about going up at the end is that everyone's going to talk about what I was supposed to talk about. So uh, I'll copy yours, though. I'll go with a show of hands. Uh, just say, Pearl Harbor, who's heard of it? What comes to mind? I presume the same thing, the movie. Uh, Tylenol, 80s, cyanide. TJ Maxx. I'd say late 2000, I'd say 2007, 2008, is that you guys see a, a relationship here? Each one almost started off something. Of course, one started off the end of the war, really. Tylenol was really interesting in terms of, hey, what happens when you're breached? Should you just come out and just be honest about it? Does it help you out? TJ Maxx, anyone here ever use a credit card at TJ Maxx? May want to get a new credit card. Uh, cost a lot of money. You mentioned earlier that, I think you kind of alluded to it, that we haven't had that kind of an event in this space, meaning mobile security. We really have not. And that's the one that probably worries me the most. I think the mobile security space is not really that well defined. Uh, maybe that's the reason why. I sometimes research and teach in these areas, and I flip-flop. I go from financial, banking industry, and security aspects there to more about a policy-oriented thing to a consumer-focused thing, and to more recently uh, a walking HIPAA violation, the healthcare mobile security aspect. Anyone here ever worked, or anyone on a pacemaker? Can I even ask that? Is anyone on a pacemaker here now? Uh, a voluntary question. Voluntary. <laughs> Just assume you are, all right? Let's, let's, let's leave it at that. Modern-day pacemaker, transmits stuff remotely. We. With, with pacemakers, it gets a little tricky because not only are they ubiquitous, you really can't encrypt everything on them because, well, for one, they're tiny. So we have a resource issue there as well. Where would that Pearl Harbor style event occur in mobility? I'm not exactly sure. And, and, and that's, that's the question I ask myself. That's the question I ask in my research and my students, and no one can really come up with it. And, uh, but we have all the, the pieces there. Right, we talk about securing things via uh, I don't know, sandboxing, uh, virtualization comes in. You've got encryption, of course, and then uh, don't forget, good old fashioned password security is still a pretty lucrative business if you decide to break into machines that are, or break into someone else's passwords. Um, that's it, that's, that's all I have. So what worries me are, is the fact that we're missing a Pearl Harbor. This is the problem of putting me in the middle of the panel because we've had Pearl Harbor already. I mean, if you, if you take a look at privacyrightsclearinghouse.org, almost 614 billion privacy records have been compromised since 2005. It's been at the internet, it's a death by a thousand cuts. In the internet echo chamber, Pearl Harbor has happened, but it's very quiet across different geo ecosystems um, and, and different spaces. But the reality is most people are totally ignoring um, when these things happen. For the Who here has not gotten a notice about um, that their privacy records have been breached. 
I got like 11 of them last year. One, seriously? What are you, like a Luddite? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the, real, the reality is that the, the Pearl Harbor has happened, um, and, and the reality is, you know, the, the U.S. government uh, and with the president this year, um, he enacted a um, executive order 13636 and presidential policy directive 21 because the entire Congress and the president understand the nature that security um, has major problems. If you, if you take a look, look at Lloyd's London, the number one thing on their register this year is cybersecurity. And that's why we are all um, working together to build the U.S. cybersecurity framework. And but, so, it, I mean, right now we are, we are in the crossroads of um, safety um, and basic practices because we need to address the miniature Pearl Harbors that have happened already over the last two decades. But Phil, I'm going to disagree just from the perspective of Pearl Harbor was a big event that everybody knew about. You're talking about things that I'd say many of these people have never heard of, and I don't think it's changed the national attitude towards security. Sure. So that's why, the, that's why the U.S. is no longer the, the dominant superpower. That's why China is. There's been a lot of copying of our intellectual property across the pond. There's a, there's a, there's a duplicate Facebook. There's a duplicate eBay. There's duplicate Twitter that's out there um, in China. Why? Our intellectual property is sitting, has been copied, and out openly it's been told to us that they have copied it. And at the end of the day, um, our economic vitality and our national security has been compromised through all these little compromises by death by a thousand cuts. But again, I think it's been kept very quiet. Jim, what do you, what do you think in this area? With respect to a Pearl Harbor that has happened? Uh, sure. The, there's, is, the, is the visibility there for security in mobile? No, or? because right now as we, look at, as we look at mobile security, we look at it from a consumerization perspective, right? If that's the correct phrase that you should use, consumerization. Everyone in here, including myself and everyone on the panel, has a series of applications or tools that they use within whatever tablet or phone or device that they have. The reality is you really don't care about TJ Maxx if it didn't happen to you, right? You just, it didn't happen to me, right? Um, if, if something happens to pick any vendor out there, if it doesn't have a direct impact on me, I just gloss over. And quite frankly, the majority of the users, the majority of the folks who use these devices are probably sitting in your class or that we just recently hired straight out of school. They really don't understand the impact of what they're doing. But, but I'll disagree in that there was a, a wireless intrusion protection industry that was really a, 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 a low-level business, and then TJ Maxx happened. And all of a sudden, that was a business that went through the roof. At least people that, you know, back to my, my comment of Wilford Brimsley, I'm the guy in the room who's paid to be nervous when nobody else is. At least some people woke up and every retailer in the world put in precautions and protections so that it didn't do another 50 and another 50 and another 50. And it was an awakening of the vulnerability of the networks and the credit card data. I don't think anything like that has happened in mobile. No, it, 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 so to that point, it hasn't or it has happened in small bursts, right? Or it's happened in isolated incidents. Um, the, the reality, or my opinion, not, not necessarily my firm's opinion or, or any, just my personal opinion. Same disclaimer for all of us, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're, we're taught to say that. Um, but, but these devices, mobility in totality, in, 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 in the broadest sense of the enterprise, is not about the device that a human being has and they interact with. It's about the infrastructure that that device can sustain or support, right? So whether you look at you know, any of the, you know, the FedEx is the world, the UPS is the world, or any of the companies that move packages and freight from one place to another. That's all done with mobile technology, and it's done with mobile security so that things get RFID tagged or barcode scanned or run through and zapped and picked up and we know where things are. Those systems are where a potential vulnerability, not for those particular companies, but those systems, industrial control, process control, SCADA systems, are where the Pearl Harbors might actually occur because they have the broadest impact against our economy or our nation or any particular uh, um, critical infrastructure component that is necessary. It's not gonna happen from personal usage. I mean, with all due respect to the Weather Channel, it's not gonna happen because someone hacked in and they got my credentials and they didn't know where I am from the Weather Channel. Who, who really cares? Unless right? your credentials from the Weather Channel are the same ones on your LinkedIn, <laughs> Facebook account. In but that's an, individual, that's an individual attack that happened to an individual that is not a broad sweeping industrial meltdown. And mobility is about personalization. The different tensions that are going on in the world are there's corporations and there's government 
that have the tension where they want to personalize you so they can sell better to you or better track you. And what we've learned since this summer is the government is connected to every major peering point on the internet. They can see everything going on that's not encrypted. What we know now too is the government can track you even when these things are turned off. What we know now as well is the government can actually decrypt anything that's encrypted on these devices. What we know now too is that a lot of uh, marketing companies um, are taking a lot of data about you and are storing them in big data <coughs> repositories all across the planet. So there's a lot of information out there about you and I think that, again the reality is Pearl Harbor was committed against us by our own government. Our own freedom, that's why I started there, was taken by our own government. Because at the same point, you're sitting there probably in your house with a camera turned on. You're probably sitting there with a microphone. We also know that the government can turn on remotely your, your camera. This is the FBI, the DEA, NSA, CIA, all of them can do it. Can turn these on remotely. You probably go to the bathroom with these things, right? And so at the, at the end of the day, what's been perpetrated on the internet is a death by a thousand cuts. And we as citizens, we want our personalization and we want people to market to us, but at the same point, anybody here like their IT department? Nobody. Does anybody want management of their IT from their IT department? Nobody. And we're, we're getting to the point where consumerization is about personalization. People want to do their own thing. They want to, they want to speak out on their own and we have this tension out there on, well, everything you're doing, you're speaking out on, is totally tracked and can be monitored. Maybe not, but it can be. So, Chris, I love the Weather Channel. I'm a Weather Channel junkie. I'm on it, I'm clicking, and boy, I remember when it said, can I track your location? I didn't think twice. I travel all the time. I said, you know where I am because I want to know, know the weather where I am, not back in Atlanta. How do you deal with privacy uh, and protection of that privacy and do you, uh, how do you think of the, the Pearl Harbor event as it would affect your business? So I mean our, our biggest principle in that regard is don't, take, don't keep data that you don't need. A lot of people keep a lot of private data just in case they might need it one day and, and our policy is if we don't need it let's, well, we can ask for it later um, and I think that's actually kept us out of trouble uh, uh, by and large. I think from a consumer standpoint, if you think about it, mobile brought consumers into the enterprise, right? It, it was the thing that started the consumerization of IT. And, and so now it's not just that enterprises are aware of, of, the, of the issue with uh, the TJ Maxx, right? It's that the consumers have to be aware. And so I think there's a big gap. Um, consumers, uh, there is some elasticity there, right? They do pay attention to some things. If we ask someone for access to your, ca uh, to your, to your contact information, We've seen our customers, they'll balk, right? They, they wanna make sure there's a trade-off. What am I getting in terms, I will give you privacy information, I will give you some of my personal data, but it has to be commensurate with what I'm getting in return. So you have to have that trade-off. But I think the biggest issue is this, this I think what you've been talking about, Alan, is this awareness. There's a, there's a huge gap in terms of awareness with consumers, and it's, and it's gonna have to be the consumers that drive this, I think, in, in the enterprises and then with mobile solutions as well. It's back to my analogy of the, you know, I'm, I'm seven years old driving down the freeway at 70 miles an hour in a station wagon, and I'm in the back seat facing the glass of the car with no seat belt on, right? Number one crash is a, is a rear end, right? If I had gotten hit in the rear, I would have been shot through that glass. But there was a convenience thing. For, for one, my parents didn't understand there was a big risk there. They didn't, they didn't know how many thousands of people were dying on the freeway. So, um, People have to have that awareness, just like the texting and driving campaign that's bringing awareness to that. I think it's going to have to take some big event, but I think there has to be that awareness to really flip the tide in terms of consumers' mind. Do you mind? You are working with young people. And, and, and let's talk about the people that really are thinking about security. I find the 18 to 21 age group is uh, <laughs> the most responsible because they don't take photos, they don't post them. They know that Snapchat and that, that, that photo disappears in three seconds, and there's no trace of that anywhere on the internet after that happens. Um, how, how do you see this changing? Is, have we gone from where uh, it's not freedom, security, convenience? Do, do you see young people maybe putting convenience or, or, or lack of thoughtfulness in front of some areas? Absolutely, that's, I think that's a great question. I think. Uh Probably because they, I, I, I just keep going back to that Pearl Harbor, TJ Maxx t style scenario, especially town hall. If you've lived through those times and you've studied that kind of history, you will have a particular mindset as far as security goes. Whereas 
the 20 year olds and I'd go as far back as let's say the 15 year old, the 12 year old, the 10 year old, single digits, nine year olds are working with tablets. I think you were talking about your kid as well. Um, they were born and raised in this environment. This is the generation of iPads, uh, whatever generation of iPad we're on right now. So I think it's going to, uh, I really do believe it's going to, it, it need, an event has to occur for them to actually truly understand the value of just, you know, not maybe accepting where you may be. It's, uh, today we think just because they don't know our location, or they don't know our location for the weather app, it really doesn't really matter all that much. But, you know, four years ago, no one would have thought that the NSA, could, well, maybe we could have thought about it. But now that it's in the forefront, everyone's talking about it. Yeah, but Medtronic, you know, they, they never thought, you know, putting a Wi-Fi device on an insulin pump and not putting encryption or passwords on that was okay as well. Right. You know, and, and um, you know, it took, took someone that was wearing that thing to talk to it from two miles away and send it, send it a lethal injection, what, what was equivalent to a lethal injection if he was wearing it. The reality is in the internet ecosystem, the internet of things, people have to realize their impact on other people. And that's what people aren't, I don't think are paying attention to at this point. So I know there's some questions in the audience, and so I would love to, uh, we've got a microphone here, and uh, we've got one right, right here. You know, are executives talking about that? Should they be? I, I, I absolutely think so. Um, we work with um, with uh, Trusty a good bit. I think there's not an analogous experience on mobile like there is in web. Web has come a little further. You see the little Trusty symbol at the bottom. You see a little lock sign if you're on an SSL connection uh, on a website. But there's not that sort of uh, uh, signage, if you will, on a mobile app experience. And so, how do you differentiate? And I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's needed. Um, there, there's not a lev level playing field necessarily. These startups are popping up, and I think especially in the younger generation, they see them all as equal, right? And so um, the, there's no really indication of who's giving your data away and how that's happening unless you read pages and pages and pages of, of uh, data. I intentionally don't go to weathersellyourprivatedata.com. That was a very <laughs> conscious decision. <laughs> Anyone else on that? Yeah, to, to David, I mean, they're, you know, we're we're at a crossroads on that. I don't think there is a solid answer, in the sense that, you know, again, this this summer um, basically makes you take a look at everything that you download, and every device you use, and you un it's not trusted anymore. And I think the awareness that has to be out there is, you know, before all this was here, how did you behave? And that's where I think our freedoms have been heavily impacted. I know I'm stressing it right now, but you know, you have to think twice on when you use stuff on what you say and what you do, because the reality is you can't trust whether that flashlight you just downloaded actually um, is, is storing um, and recording what you're saying and sending it off somewhere to be analyzed by somebody else. So I, I think, you know, is it a value prop for a company? Yes. Is there a trustee um, equivalent? I, I disagree because, you know, you, right now you, you can't trust anything you download, especially on an Android store. So. Hi, I'm Ashok Kumar. I am a current analysis industry analyst. And keeping with the discussion about the type of event that could happen, my question is all about mobile is about numbers. It's like there's a billion smartphones and 10 billion probably M2M devices and things like that. So for an event of the magnitude, would it have to be in very large numbers that crosses borders or regions of the world? more so than necessarily the econ economic impact uh, for it to gain the attention. I'll go. You brought uh, Pearl Harbor, you get to I, 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 yeah, I brought Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Didn't realize that would start a theme here. Uh, not necessarily. I think, uh, the, I'm not sure if it was Jim who brought up that point, that if it does not impact me personally, then it really doesn't matter. And that's, that's really true. Uh, I would think if, if, if an event, if I had to guess what it would be, it would probably be something related to healthcare because that is technically personal or it's personal to everyone. You may be 12, but I have a feeling that at some point even you would actually think about your health, maybe when you're 14. Um, 
So it, it doesn't have to have the numbers, I think, but I, I could be wrong. Because the financial sector has been going through uh, security breaches forever. I mean, credit cards coming into your mail. I've had I don't know how many letters come in, and I honestly don't even think about it. I get a privacy notice, I tear it up, and it goes in my little shredder. Uh, but healthcare is the one where I think where it really may come into, come into play. And that, I don't think that has to be big. Because I actually, you know, a healthcare IT security be breach, if it were to show up, let's say someone broke into a pacemakers, I'm sure the CIA would love that. But any one of those kinds, I think, should be enough. Nothing, uh, patient records gets lost. Ah, I think, that's okay. Uh, I think mobile payments is where I think the next big thing is going to happen. I do think that it's, um, uh, one of the things that's taken for granted is some of the protections you get with credit cards, right? Credit cards give you a limitation on your liability. Uh, if you're purchasing something with a prepaid or is tied to your, to your card through a different account, there's, you know, you don't know, you may not know what kind of limitations you have. So if someone hacks into your account, they're actually hacking into a part of your identity. So in the TJ Maxx thing, I tear up my credit card, I'm limited to some cap on, on how much I'm exposed to in that scenario. But if you hack into my phone and I'm connected to all kinds of things where I'm making mobile payments and, and it's attached to my bank account, do you know what your limitations are in the liability? I don't think customers understand that. They're like, oh, that's really convenient. I can upload a check with a, with a click. But mm -hmm. w what are the protections if that goes south? So. And we're, we're in a, new, a state of the new normal, right? I mean, we've all been desensitized to the breaches. At the same point, it, again, it's all personalized. Until you are affected by an identity theft situation that affects you or a family member, you don't realize how long and hard it is to go fight that. My, my, um, I have a relative that fought it, and she fought it for 11 years. And um, it's, it's very damaging, and it's painful. And I think, um, you know, until, I don't think we'll ever have the, the Pearl Harbor um, exactly type situation that we're all talking about, but it's gonna be personal attacks. And, and so I'm gonna actually switch from kind of the, okay, here's the hostile to the, what's happening in mobile. I'm walking around with two, right? Because I'm on the phone on one, and I'm looking at another, I'm on both phones. And the reality is, this is kind of, this is enabled life for me. It's connected to me to people that are 10,000 miles away that are my friends that I've never met, that I work in a global ecosystem to do cybersecurity across the planet. And I think at the end of the day, like this is the future. We're here. And um, you know, like one of my favorite authors is William Gibson. And I think he is the most prophetic um, author out there. He wrote Cyberpunk. He wrote Neuromancer. And um, our, our state of new normal is the hackers. Now we know that there's government hackers. Besides regular, you know, cyber criminal hackers, nation state hacktivists that are out there, and um, you know, I would arm up if I were you all. That's where I started, um, because at the end of the day, th those folks are the ones that are going to win in this digital economy. And um, like, I, I think, I think at the end of the day, that you know, if you look at it, even you know, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, he's a hacker. You know, Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, those guys are hackers. Steve Allen or um, Allen um, from from Microsoft. And we, we are continuing down the same road where kind of the most prolific hackers that are innovative are the ones that are gonna win in the new economy. And so I'm not poo-pooing this stuff, I'm just, I'm preaching education. Be aware of what you're doing, what you're doing it with, and um, you know, with, you know, today is a perfect day. Today, today is the first day of um, uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, right? And the campaign there is Stop, Think, Connect. And I think if you, if you, if you take in context freedom, security, convenience, and you think, stop, think, connect, right after it. It's what are you doing here, and how are you doing it, and you're, you're, you're more well-armed. And, and I would be thinking these things are probably hacked. So you may want to restore, re reboot, refresh, re rewrite over these things every so often. Maybe your home PCs too. I'm being a propeller hat right here, but at the end of the day, somebody's probably gonna compromise this within the next 90 days, and may want to think, well, for now, how do I defend myself? as best as I can while still living the dream of mobility. You know, one other thought is that maybe one story needs to capture the national attention. I don't know that it needs to be a Pearl Harbor, but you, you think of stories that, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but if we saw a different murder every day on CNN or Fox News, uh, it would just be, we'd be desensitized. But they find one that's a story that captures national attention and suddenly it's on for 37 days through the entire process. And I think something will capture the national attention on security that I think may raise some of this awareness, but, but that's the kind of thing it'll take. Hopefully it won't take something of disastrous economic or, or uh, proportion 
uh, hopefully we can get there before that. We, we, we've, I'm telling you, we've just been so desensitized. I mean, if you look at last week, right, Miss Teen USA, a 19-year-old college student was tapping into her computer and uh, privately videotaping, um, uh, taking pictures, snapping photos, and then um, uh, he was threatening to um, release photos that if she didn't hop on a, a Snapchat with her and do what he said on the webcam, um, and she, she immediately called the FBI. If that doesn't immediately tell you these things and your, your computer's at home, um, don't have full access. It, 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 this is the Fourth Amendment, you know, it lost, right? People inside your house can see everything here, everything going on between you and your spouse and your family. It's, it's, that's gone. And I think the reality is we have to really understand kind of what these things are doing and how best to protect ourselves. And it's the Wild West. It still is. That's the Internet. That's the Internet I graduated from college from in 93. Jim, you, you advise a lot of companies, and I think that there's a lot of situations where even the food and shelter level of security is not being met. It's not about the super hack, it's not about the, uh, the, the, the Russian trying to get into your systems, but it's just the day-to-day -day stuff. But what advice do you generally find, or are there certain things that when you talk to companies you say, step one, step two, step three? With mobile security or security in general? Mobile, since this is focusing on mobile, let's start there. Yeah, the, you know, the simplest, the simplest answer, at least from our perspective, and we preach this as a firm, so this is the firm's perspective as well as mine, is understand what your interactions are going to be or what you're asking your users' interactions to be, what the use cases are, and what the data is that people need to access. And create the structure around your information security and control policies for mobility around the access of that data, right? If you do that, you can, you, look, Let's just be frank. There's a lot of scary, bad things going on in the world. Everyone in this room is going to die at some point. Someone will get hit by a car. Someone will have a heart attack. Someone will have, someone will live to be 102. Everyone in this room is going to die. So let's just get that on the table and just say, okay, now that we know that we're all going to die, how do we better protect ourselves? How do we do preventative maintenance? How do we take the right medications the doctors prescribe or you know, eat the right foods or exercise appropriately. Treat your data and the mobility and the access through that data just like a prescription that a doctor would give you or just like a health plan that you would check up on. You're going to have an issue. Let's get past it and let's just use the information as best as we can in the context or the construct that we need to use it and protect it as best as we can. The benefits, then we move forward. Benefits greatly outweighing the downside. Absolutely. Another question? Good morning, thank you. My name is Hamish Caldwell. I'm with Information and the Enterprise Mobility Management Solution Provider. I'm scared. You, you guys succeeded. I'm scared. But here we are in Atlanta looking for business opportunities. So what are the, the solution pieces in the next few years? I mean, there's already companies like Airwatch that provide components of things that I would have thought would address some of the problems, but there's something obviously missing. So what's the opportunity for entrepreneurs here in Atlanta to look to what are the pieces that need to come together and therefore present a near-term business opportunity to at least start progressing to resolve the issues you've so well scared us all? I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab um, because I've been so negative. <laughs> you know, um, and Phil's trying to profit from all this, so. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Cisco CTO that came up had a really interesting um, diagram, his simplified diagram. And I think there are a lot of opportunities where we can take back the internet. And um, I think there are a ton of opportunities for net mesh networks, private networks, private exchanges um, that use transparency um, to their customer base on how they operate. And I, th I think there, there's a huge opportunity there to kind of change kind of the first version of the internet, the way, the way we've seen it and operated in it, to be much more secure. And um, we've also heard from other countries that are outraged on what's happened with the U.S. and the NSA, that um, like Brazil, they're looking to disconnect directly from the internet, from from the American internet, um, and move to exchanges um, abroad on the other side of the pond. There's countries like China that have already built firewalls around their environment and building their own ecosystems. I think um, we will see multiple instances of private networks um, that are um, geo, uh, or, uh, geo geo location oriented, and I think what's going to be interesting is watching kind of the privacy and security experts see how they can maneuver around that to start almost a new paradigm of how the internet operates. It's not just a series of routers and, and um, you know, carrier networks. 
Um, it, it'll be mesh private networks from person to person. They may even network from house to house. And so there's whole business opportunities, I think, that will explode out of this that we've never thought, we would ever, never dreamed imaginable. You know, I, who would ever thought that, you know, when you, t when you talk to, here's my iPhone versus my Android phone, um, Siri, you know, anybody here watch Star Trek? Well, Siri is that computer voice talking to the World Wide Web. You know, you have the computer of, of Star Trek come to life. And I think there's more opportunities like that that will connect the entire planet you can talk directly to, and the, the world's data will be at your fingertips. And how we interact with that and how we safely do it, I think we're all just um, getting to the, just the beginnings of it. Do you mind, if I, I, if I, I can, real quick, just to try to answer your question very tactically. Um, in the world that we live in, if I know who you are and I can authenticate who you are, then I want to do a transaction with you. So if you think about things from an entrepreneur perspective, whether it's technology, it's solutions, it's applications or process, whether it's a mesh network or not, if you think about it from that perspective, I'll do business with you. Or I'll recommend to our clients that they should do business in that manner, right? So if you're looking for opportunities, think from an authentication perspective, out of band, multi-factor, whatever it may be. Think in that regard so that I can ensure I know who you are and I've authenticated who you are so that I can do that transaction at a business layer. Identity. That's what I would focus Identity, on. Identity, right? Hey, mind, I don't think there's anything more powerful than the young people. Uh, what ideas are you seeing coming out of them? Or are you seeing a lot of the universities are coming up with a rich ecosystem of their grad students, et cetera. Are you seeing uh, any great shifts out there or, well, or ideas? The, uh, there are two parts to that answer. First is the teaching aspect. And uh, we're, we're just now catching up with just good old fashioned security. This idea of a firewall, for example, We've talked about it before. It really does not exist in a, in a mobile space. But the other aspect is the research one, where you're beginning to see a lot of work being done. So for a business, to answer your question, uh, some of the opportunities that lie are in the kind of human resource you may have access to over here. Students are definitely interested in this if they see the value proposition. In other words, can they get a job? Uh, sole reason why we get a lot of InfoSec majors. Earlier in, the, in that intro video, there were only three universities, I think, that were highlighted. I may be forgetting. I think Georgia State, Kennesaw State, and Emory. But there are 31 state institutions in this state. There are 20-something tech schools. That's over 50 in a, in a state the size of Georgia. And really, I think 48 are in Atlanta. So uh, the space is very rich for you. And really, you need to almost engage with universities in many ways as well. Because honestly, we sometimes don't have the resources for it. As much as I talk about breaking into a ubiquitous healthcare device, that's going to take some lab work. And we simply don't have access to those. So it's sometimes a theoretical concept. Every once in a while, it can actually be done for real, I think, as well. But mobility has also changed for the, the, the younger generations. Because if you look in the past, right, it was these pockets of 20, 15 year plus generations. But the reality is that the Facebook generation in the younger crowd, they don't want to use Facebook. They don't, they, they're switching to other means of communication because Facebook's not cool to them. And so I think if you're, from a business perspective, I mean, it's almost like ADD, right? Because um, each generation and each small pocket of generation moves away from one technology to another within, within almost several, several years. And so you have to keep innovating or um, growing your technology base like Google has. Um, in order to keep, keep the hearts and minds of your cust the various customer base by the generation. So Chris, I'm uh, thinking a good business model for the weather uh, channel may be actually controlling the weather. Can you speak on when you'll be able to do that? Yeah, it's in R&D now. I can't talk about <laughs> it. It's coming up. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. <clears throat> I'm Michael Halpert with Mindtree. And I have a very interesting question for you because we've talked a bit about exchanging our security and privacy for these ubiquitous devices that we all love and carry around. But the concern I have is for children. And we haven't spoken about children yet, but they're completely unsafe in this environment. And it doesn't take even much of a hacker to take any of your kids right now with their mobile phone and tell you what school they go to, where they go after school, what activities they have are doing where their home is and where they sleep. Uh, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we're going to keep our children safe as we approach and live to learn in this new uh, reality. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I, I, I seriously I go back to that same analogy. We look back and like, what were we thinking driving down the freeway with no seatbelts? 
in these cars with no crumple zones and no safety precautions. So I think the same thing. I think 20 years from now, we're going to be like, what were, the, were those people thinking? They're like posting stuff on Facebook for the whole world to see. Um, I, I think there's a lot of education. I think as far as a business idea, I think it's, as, to me, it's as simple as making it clear to the user and giving the user choice. Allowing me to manage what things access my information and making that very clear. If you were to sign on to an application through Facebook, I bet most people don't understand what they've actually signed on for. What can Facebook do on your behalf? What can someone see as a result of that? A lot of people who post stuff on Facebook don't realize criminals can actually look on your account, see that you're posting stuff while you're out of town, get your address, and go right to your house. So people don't understand that. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for innovation in this space to the previous question. I think which answers your question is, we need innovation around allowing customers to manage their own, st their own information. And, and whether I'm ac accessing Facebook or Weather Channel or whatever application I'm using, I'm in control of that. I think that would be a, a huge step forward. So in the traditional space, right, I mean, we've, we've had antivirus and personal firewalls and URL, uh, you know, net nanny on, on, on Windows PCs for several decades now. And on the mobile space, there are a few companies that are out there. So I'm on the, uh, disclosure, I'm on the board for a company called Mobile Active Defense. And so they intercept traffic and they can do URL filtering on the traffic. And so I think there are solutions that are out there that use kind of the paradigm of old um, uh, that, that can also provide a safer internet browsing experience. But I think the reality is, and I'll speak, I'll speak directly personally about myself, but uh, you know, I, I gave my son um, my first iPhone um, in 2008. So he was, he was three years old, and um, he had my, I gave him my iPhone, I took the SIM card out, um, but Wi-Fi was on, and literally like within six months, he downloaded a, a, a game called Farm Story from a company called LavaSoft, yeah, I'm outing them. And what's interesting is um, within an hour, I got an email that basically said, thank you for purchasing 4750, and another one within 30 seconds, that said, thank you for purchasing 50, 5110. And the reality is, he was playing this freeware game called Farm Story, and he was making in-game purchases. I watched him play the first two levels, and then the third level, the purchasing began. And I complained up on the, the, the forums, and, um, and then I looked in the other, there's other parents, like every other comment was, hey, my kid spent 50 bucks, which is what happened to me. I spent 100 bucks, also happened to me. And so this game was actively um, defrauding um, as a freeware game who they knew their customer base was, which is student kids. And I agree with you. I think there is um, a time where we're going to probably go back um, and hopefully soon to take a look at that and try to solve that as a problem. So not, again, we're, we're at the infancy of all this, and, but there are some solutions out there like URL filtering. And there are vendors out there that are doing that stuff today. Great. Well, on behalf of the entire panel, we're now out of time, but we want to thank you all for joining us and for all your questions. Thank you. Good job, guys. I said email.